Let's welcome Monica up to the front. Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm nervous, that's how I am. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm standing back here so you don't see my knees knocking. Um, most of you probably know me. I've been a member here at Zion for over 40 years. Doug and I were married here at this church. Our children were baptized, confirmed, and married here as well. I was blessed to have been born into a loving Christian home, and I don't remember a time in my life when I didn't know and love Jesus. Um, and my story isn't unique. I'm sure that everyone here has had a trial in their life, be it an illness or a loss or just being unsure of the future. God's plan for my life was not what I had planned, but he blessed me with a wonderful, loving husband who has been he's standing by my side for over 33 years. I wish I was back there with him right now. <laughs> um, he protected me through a major surgery early in our marriage and um, removed a, a large tumor and an adrenal gland. And praise the Lord, as a result of that surgery, we were able to have children. After a four-month recovery period, I went back to work and I noticed a significant change in my vision. So my doctor sent me to the eye clinic in Vancouver and I had testing. And that's when I discovered that, I learned that I had retinitis pigmentosa, RP. That was a shock. I still remember sitting in the doctor's office, in the ophthalmologist's office, and he was telling me about it, and I'm thinking, oh God, blind? Totally dark. I'm afraid of the dark. You know that, God. How can I do this? And as I was absorbing that fact, I heard him say, and I suggest that you and your husband don't have any children. So that was two bombshells within a couple of minutes, and I was devastated. I cried and prayed and pleaded and begged God to change it. And uh, through all of these emotions, God was faithful, and he did give us answers and he did give us direction. We were blessed with two beautiful, healthy boys, and I thank and praise God for that. The RP um, caused me to lose my vision gradually, which was a blessing because I was able to adjust and cope to my, the changes in my life. I struggled with many tears, feelings of inadequacy and guilt. Poor Doug, stuck with a blind wife and my kids. They have a mom who can't do things that normal moms do. But there again, God surrounded me with a loving family who helped me and friends, and members of Bible study who supported me and prayed for me and helped me get over those rough bumps. Gradually, I started to think a little bit more positively and focus on what I can do rather than what I can't do. God blessed me with my first guide dog, Anya, who enabled me to travel independently, and we went everywhere together. God, um, I... We went into Vancouver, and uh, I enrolled at VCC College on Broadway campus and became a part-time student there. For a year, I learned uh, Braille and also computer skills, how to use a computer with voice control. And then I joined a, an RP support group where I met other blind and visually impaired persons who I befriended, and they inspired me. I... I um, became a peer counselor at the CNIB, and now I counsel other clients who have recently lost their vision. God was with me every step of the way and guided me. I found myself in many different situations, some humorous and some a little frightening if I was disorientated and lost my way. But I trust every time I leave the house that Jesus is guarding me He's watching over me, and I know that he sends guardian angels. I, um, the blindness has certainly caused challenges in my life, but not necessarily barriers. I 
I'm learning new skills all the time, and with modern technology, things are much more easily accessible for me, and there are limitless opportunities available to me. I uh, do struggle with mingling in a crowd, in a big group, but I meet people all the time when I'm on the bus or SkyTrain or even walking down the street, and my first impression of anyone is not what they look like or what they're wearing, rather the sound of their voice, happy or sad or, or grumpy. But uh, God, uh, God has, through my blindness, broken down the barriers of fear and uh, prejudice. I am so grateful for what he has enabled me to experience and see before I lost my vision. I've lived in BC all my life and love the changing seasons, the beauty that's out there, the mountains. And one of my favorite uh, verses is Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. How awesome is that? I don't uh, question my vision loss anymore. God, in his perfect wisdom, has chosen this path in my life, and he's helping me walk it. And I know he has a purpose for me. I remember a few years ago when Pastor Jim came to visit, he asked me, Monica, how would you feel if you're, you regained your sight? And I thought, overwhelmed? I don't know. I think it might be just as much of a shock as when I lost it. I think I'd scare myself if I looked in the mirror, let alone I wouldn't recognize any of you. You all are eternally youthful to me still. <laughs> I, um, I am so blessed, and God is so good. He has given me peace and contentment living with blindness. I have so many visions and pictures in my mind that I will treasure forever. I know there will still be difficulties, and I do slip into that sad, depressing time sometimes, especially in momentous occasions. I wish I could have seen the boys graduate, and I know that I would have loved to see them with their beautiful brides on their wedding day. I know it's going to be hard. not being able to see my first grandchild. But God will help me through that too, and I am excitedly waiting for the time when I can hold that precious little one in my arms. I love the Lord with all my heart and soul, and I believe in His promises, and my hope is eternal. I know that in the presence of Jesus, I will see again, and I will rejoice. God has not changed the circumstances in my life or in, in anyone's life. Sometimes he chooses not to change the circumstances. But he does give you the peace and the, the strength and the courage to live through the situation that you're in. A verse that comes to me often is, Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you. Why don't we pray while we have you here, Monica? Can I pray with you for a second? Let's pray for Monica. God, we thank you so much for Monica, for this uh, amazing woman uh, of faith. We thank you that you have uh, blessed her and walked with her. We thank you that you've um, gifted her with such an amazing husband and such great kids. And we thank you for the gift of uh, walking with her and serving with her as she uh, just embodies so many of uh, your characteristics, your love, your joy, your heart of service for other people. We just thank you for that. We pray that you'd be with her. Whatever life holds down the road, we just pray that you continue to walk with her, lead her and guide her and protect her. We thank you for the privilege of uh, serving with this amazing woman. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. Let's thank Monica again for sharing her story with us.
Well, this morning, I really appreciate Monica doing that and telling us a bit about her life, that Monica lives uh, with the reality of knowing that she lives in a world that she cannot see. Uh, She does not see the world around her. You and I live with that same reality. As we look at the Bible, lots of you have written questions about angels, the spiritual world, about demons. What are all these things about? Well, that's what we're talking about this morning, and we need to start by just saying the truth is we do not see it. There is such a huge Uh, just a a depth of things going on around us that we are completely blind to the majority of the time. And unfortunately, what happens is we often get pictures or images from the wrong place. And so, I mean, how many of you have ever seen a picture of an angel with wings playing a harp with a halo, right? I mean, or a cute chubby little baby shooting arrows at people and it has wings, right? I mean, we see these images. Well, those are false. Those are not true pictures. I don't remember ever reading in the Bible about a flying, halo-playing, uh, uh, halo-wearing, harp-playing angel anywhere. It just doesn't appear. It just doesn't exist. And so this morning, as we look at angels and demons, we're going to turn to the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about all of those things. C.S. Lewis has this interesting quote when he talks about, he's talking specifically about demons, but angels as well. I'll read it for you. He says this, He says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall. One is to disbelieve in their existence. I don't see it, so it can't be real. That's the first danger. The other danger is this, to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Uh, All I ever think about, all I ever talk about, all I ever, uh, you know, if the price of milk goes down at the store, must have been an angel helping me out. If price goes up, must have been the devil you know, getting me on the long weekend. It's just unhealthy to think that angels and demons are up to everything. It's also unhealthy to think that they're up to nothing. Uh, So this morning we're looking at the Bible and what it has to say. We'll start here. Angels were created by God. Uh, We're told that nothing existed without God creating them and that God created everything in the span of six days. We believe that the angels were created at some point, even though they aren't listed, in those six days as well. The word angel means messenger. Probably lots of you know that. In Hebrew and Greek, the word means messenger. And what we see them do primarily in the Bible is deliver messages to people. Uh, Can anyone think of someone who got a message from an angel in the Bible? Mary, a most common one. Mary, Gabriel shows up and says, Mary, you are going to have a child. And this whole story unfolds. Another example would be, Um, Joseph, right? Immediately after that, an angel appears to Joseph and says, listen, this is what's going to happen. Angels are messengers. They bring messages to God's people from God. Sometimes answers to prayer. This is what God has said to you. Uh, Sometimes warnings. This is what's going to happen to you. Uh, Angels come and go uh, delivering messages to us from God. I want to read one account for you of that happening. It's One of the most exciting ones in the Bible, I think, is from Daniel 10, and you'll probably be familiar with this story. From Daniel 10, Daniel's been praying and fasting and mourning and uh, picking up at verse 12, this angel appears to him. It says, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up, for I've now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up and stood up trembling. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, but I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come." It's interesting to think, well, often we'll say, when you pray, God answers yes or no or maybe, but sometimes you might have thought that the answer is no because you haven't heard from God, and there's this delay. There's been this heavenly delay, which we hear about here. This angel comes and says, Daniel, we heard you on day one. I came to tell you, but I was tied up with this spiritual battle, the spiritual fight that was going on and that you couldn't see. Angels are messengers of God. Angels are different than us. How many of you ever heard that when you die, you get your wings and become an angel? 
Okay, it's not nowhere in the Bible, okay? I'm sorry to tell you, you will not get fluffy white wings and a halo and a harp the second that you die. Angels are different beings in us, different creatures. The Bible describes them as being spiritual beings. Hebrews 1.14 says, Are not all angels ministering spirits? They're spirits. And Jesus said this about spirits. Spirits do not have flesh and blood like you see that I have. So don't think of a physical body with bones and nice jaw structure. That's not what angels are all about. Angels are spiritual beings. Yes, at times they appear in the Bible like a man uh, standing there in front of someone, recognized as a human. But that's just a form that they're taking, uh, just the way that they're choosing to appear. Uh, Some people would speculate that they can change and appear at any shape that they want to, and they would point to Genesis 3 when uh, the devil seems to appear as a serpent. Uh, Angels are spiritual beings. They're not bound to a physical body like you and I are. At the same time, they do seem to be limited to being at one spot at one time. They're not everywhere. They're not all-powerful, even though God has made them extremely powerful. Angels are different than us. Angels can be visible or invisible. Angels can come and go to heaven and earth. Uh, They can alter their appearance. Sometimes people, angels have appeared and people didn't know they were seeing an angel. We see that in the Bible. Angels are extremely powerful. The Psalms describe them as the mighty ones or the mighty ones of God, these powerful angels. There's a set number of angels, according to the Bible. Uh, Jesus talks about, uh, he's debating with these Sadducees and, and Jesus about marriage in heaven. And Jesus says, you don't understand because you don't understand the scriptures. When we get into heaven, we won't marry or be married just like the angels don't marry. There's a, a set number of angels that God created. And they're not marrying and reproducing. There's just the number that God created. Well, how many is that? We don't know for sure. The Bible tells us at one point there's 10,000 times 10,000. Any math whiz want to tell us the final number there? A million. 10,000 times 10,000 is a million. But often the Bible uses a number like a million. It's just saying lots, more than you can count. There are just tons and tons of these angelic beings. In other places it says the, the great host or the great company of heaven. This huge array of angels. And angels have this job primarily of uh, delivering message to us, uh, an answered prayer, a warning, uh, also protecting us. Lots of people ask about guardian angels. Do we all have a guardian angel? At one point, Jesus says um, about little children that their guardian angel um, sees them and watches over them. But it doesn't ever say every single person has a guardian angel that follows them around all the time for all of their lives. What it does say is that angels are sent to watch over and protect us. Uh, One example is in Psalm 91. It says, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. I I don't know if you have your very own angel watching over you. I do know that you have God's angels watching over you. Uh, all the time. God watches over us. God's angels are watching over us. We were just camping this week in Kelowna, and just as fate would have it, we were at this campsite where we could look across the lake and see Miranda's parents' house. They could bring out their binoculars and say, yeah, we see you on the beach. The kids are swimming too far out. Get them, go get them. It was interesting to know, well, somebody's watching over me, right? God's angels are watching over you. God is watching over you. But why does all of this matter? Why do angels matter? Why are they in the Bible? Why do we get so caught up in them sometimes? Uh, well, it matters because it just shows us again God's great love and concern and care for us. God creates us, and then he creates this whole other spiritual dimension, this realm of beings who are meant to watch over us who are meant to bring God's word to us, who are meant to protect us, who are meant to come minister to us when we're down. Maybe you remember when Jesus, after he'd been tempted by the devil and he'd been fasting, it says, then the angels came and ministered to him. Uh, Another time, uh, some of the disciples are in jail and, and angels come and set them free. Angels are there to help us out. Angels are there to watch over us, protect us, and deliver messages to us from God. That's why it's important. It reveals more of God's love for us. 
Another reason it's important is because when God created angels, he created them to be extremely powerful. He gave them incredible freedom, incredible knowledge. And some of those angels use that freedom to rebel against God. We don't have all the details, all the specifics, but it seems as though this rebellion began and First Timothy seems to suggest that it was out of pride, out of arrogance that this one particular devil, Lucifer, or the devil, or Satan, rebelled against God, didn't want to just be one of his servants, but wanted to be God himself. We don't know how many angels he led away in the rebellion. Revelation gives us this picture of a third of the angels being swept down with him. We don't know if it's exactly a third, but a third of these angels are now fallen angels that we would call demons. Angels were meant to bring us messages of life and truth. Demons are a corruption of everything God made them to be. So instead of bringing messages of life and truth, they bring messages of deceit and lies. Instead of coming to watch over us and protect us and care for us, they come only to um, trip us up and to hurt us and to harm us. Uh, Jesus, when he was talking about the devil and his demons, says uh, the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. He's only bent on your destruction all of the time. And that's important to know because you can't trust every voice you hear or every vision that you have or every story that someone tells you about something miraculous. Instead, the Bible tells us to test the spirits. And a really easy test for spirits, angels, demons, is to just look at what their focus is. Are they directing your focus and attention to God, or are they directing it to themselves? Uh, Angels in the Bible are never worshipped. In fact, when people would bow down to worship them, there's this great example in Revelation where uh, Paul falls to the ground and wants to worship him, and the angel says, do not do it. I, too, am a fellow servant of God. Worship him. We don't worship angels. If an angel directs you to worship it, or if an angel gives you a message that's all about you and your importance and who you are and um, you're saving yourself or you don't need Jesus, anything like that, then then do not listen to that angel because it's a demon. It's also interesting to think about angels and demons. We can get so caught up in them, fascinated in them, interested in them. And yet, just imagine this, that up to a third of the angels fall from heaven, and God does not come to rescue them. Instead, Jesus tells us that hell was created for them. Those angels that rebelled, God does not come to rescue them. He makes that their final judgment and sentence. We sin, we fall, and God does come to rescue us. He doesn't just send an angel to do that. He, he comes himself, Jesus himself, wraps himself in flesh, lives for us, dies for us, rises again for us. I love in Hebrews 1, it talks about Jesus is so much more superior than all of the angels. It's a great uh, just perspective. The beginning of Hebrews just tells you Jesus is greater than uh, anyone you can think of, greater than the angels, greater than Abraham, greater than Moses, greater than all the prophets. Jesus is the greatest, and it's Jesus who comes and lives for us, dies for us, rises again so that we can be forgiven, we can have eternal life. And one day we can have perfect vision where we not only see Jesus face to face, we also see all these other mysteries revealed for us and to us. Uh, We don't worship angels and demons. Uh, uh, We don't stake our hopes in them. They're not our, our saviors. They're not our deliverance. If you never see an angel in your entire life, you've missed out on nothing. You'll, you'll get sick of seeing them in heaven. You get to see them all the time. If, if you never hear the voice of an angel, that's okay. It doesn't mean God loves you more or less. God's whole purpose for angels is not to draw attention to them, but to focus your eyes on him, to lead, guide, and direct you through them. And then one day, like Monica said, all of our eyes will be opened to this world that's around us. Um, We will see the angels. We will see Jesus. I was talking with one pastor once, and he said, just imagine. Imagine this with me for a minute. Just close your eyes. Go ahead, and you can close them for real. I'm I'm looking at you. I'll keep mine open, see if yours are closed. Imagine you're putting on these spiritual glasses, these spiritual lenses, 
and all of a sudden you can see angels and demons. Does that make life better or worse for you? I don't know. Someone said worse. I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of frightening to think. I mean, whenever someone sees an angel in the Bible, they fall to the ground terrified. Warriors fall to the ground terrified. I mean, they're just these such powerful, such uh, brilliant, such uh, just amazing beings. And yet God's focus is not on them, it's on you, about loving you, redeeming you, rescuing you, saving you, and bringing you into his kingdom. You can open your eyes if you want. If you find at some point that you're just feeling down, defeated, like the, like the opposition you're facing is too great for you, I encourage you to remember in the Bible this great account where... Um, I can't think of the uh, textual reference right now. I believe that it's Elijah, and he's with this man. I'm not going to guess at his name. They're totally outnumbered, totally surrounded. And Elijah says, God, just open up his eyes for a minute. Because Elijah says to him, the ones who are for us are so much greater than the ones who are against us. And this man's eyes are open, and he just sees this wall of angelic soldiers and warriors there to protect and defend and cover them. Whatever situation you're in right now, God has got you covered. Uh, God God has got you covered through the protection of his angels. Uh, Some people see angels everywhere. I I saw this story in the news, I think it was last week, this man was in an accident, he was trapped in his car, it lit on fire, another man ran up, grabbed the top of the door and bent the door of his car down. Did you see this? He bent his door down enough that it shattered the window and the man escaped. Sometimes we hear about these incredible acts of strength because of all the adrenaline in someone's body. I think it's just very plausible to think there was an angel just pulling on that door with him trying to rescue that man. I can think of all sorts of stories where I think, I don't know, I don't have the the vision to see it, but if God's angels are there to watch over us, guide us, protect us, I just think that there's probably angels all of the time. I think of my mom, or I think sometimes even we say this, where we just miss something. We say, oh, we just squished a couple angels, (laughs) right? They're just intervening for us, helping us out, mostly when I'm driving. God's got you covered. God's got you covered. Even if you cannot see it, God's at work. God's got you covered through his angels. But most of all, God has got you covered through his son, Jesus, who saves everyone who calls on his name, who forgives every sin that's presented to him. Even the ones that we forget, we can't list them. If you believe in Jesus, he's got all your sins covered. You're set free by him, free to live in this world without fear of death or angels or demons or or blindness or anything else that the world can throw at you because God loves you so much. And together, may we keep worshiping him and walking with him until the day that our eyes are open. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.